television event. Thank you very much, Jeffrey Akko. Um, I will be calling. I will be calling up on stage um, the D, the director of communications for the Temple Management Company, Mr. Tefa Tili Gyado, to share more light on why the BRF Gap Fest was created and just basically tell us more about this. Thank you, ladies. A round of applause for Mr. Tefa, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, um, His Excellency. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the inaugural um, Babatunde Raji Fashola Gap Fest. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to wish a happy 55th birthday to His Excellency. <laughs> now, um, in thinking of a um, worthy birthday celebration for His Excellency, you know, um, it's always a challenge. Because His Excellency is not a man of um, serenity, he is not a man of ceremony, he is a man of cerebrality. And the best gift you can give to him is intellectual stimulation. And in fact, we have a private joke between ourselves that um, His Excellency has a working knowledge of most topics under the sun. He is an expert, of course, in the legal field, he is an expert in housing in power, in works. He's also an expert in things like aeronautical engineering, in football, in sports, and various other subjects. And it is that thirst for knowledge that he shares with another group of people, specifically young people. And perhaps there's nothing that gives him greater intellectual stimulation than engaging with young people. So we felt it was quite appropriate that for, to celebrate him rather than a party or you know, any great ceremony that we would have something that um, celebrates the amazing achievements of the young people in this country. And when you also check his record as a public servant, um, he has always created an enabling platform for young people to thrive in genuine positions of authority. His entire backroom staff, for example, was made up of people in their 20s and 30s you know, during his time as the uh, Lagos State Governor. Um, there have been people who have held positions as managing directors, you know, and various other um, powerful positions. So we felt this was a very fitting way to celebrate his 55th birthday. Um, today um, will be filled with discourse by highly influential and inspirational young people. Um, and they'll be talking about some of their own amazing experiences. But our takeaway today really should be to look at how we can take um, their own experiences and turn them into something that appeals to a wide uh, range of people um, and we we think that by um, listening to some of the you know really amazing people that we have here today that that would be a great way to do it as I said this is the inaugural gap fest uh, we want to come back here when um, his excellency is 56 we want to come back here when he's 67 we want to come back here when he's 88 we want to come back here when he's 99 we want to come back here when he's 100 so once again your excellency without further ado uh, a happy birthday to you um, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tefa. Um, I would be calling up our keynote speaker for the BRF Gap Fest 2018. Our keynote speaker is a graduate of chemistry from the University of Ife, Nigeria, an alumni of the Chief Executive Program of Lagos Business School the Global Executive MBA of IESE Business School, Barcelona, Spain, and Global CEO Program of Wharton IESE and CEIBS Business Schools. Our keynote speaker is a multiple award-winning entrepreneur and the first Nigerian recipient of the prestigious International Women Entrepreneurial Challenge Award, IWEC, 
as a nominee of the U.S. Department of State in 2008. Ladies and gentlemen, can we give a big round of applause to Mrs. Ibuku Awoshika. Happy birthday, His Excellency or Honorable Minister. You know, when you've had to bear so many titles, you get confused as to which one to use. But the best title I have for him is as my friend and as my brother. And uh, we grew up together over so many years. So we've had many decades of watching each other emerge. His wife is my husband's cousin, so she's my sister. But I'd known him long before she met him and before I met her brother that I married. <laughs> so, too many things tied together. But I can say that um, I'm not surprised that where he is today, he's always been diligent, he's always been deliberate, He's always been one you could count on and trust. He's always been very faithful. And when I realized he was going to run for the governorship of Lagos State then, I knew without a doubt it was a chance to reset things and to move the state forward. And. Um, It's very heartening to see that Lagos is a great light in terms of representing what Nigeria, a great micro, uh, microcosm of what Nigeria can be. And everywhere you go around the world, you're very proud to respond to people when they start the story of Nigeria, but they're forced to acknowledge the light that Lagos has represented. And I'm proud of the fact that you were a great part of that in different ways. So I'll always be proud of you. Now, as for your children that have put today together, when you sow in the lives of people, there's always a time to reap. So I think that you've invested in their different lives. And at this point in time, they feel that they need to celebrate you. So I guess they're going to be celebrating you till you're 100. We'll find the right stick for you to walk up the steps. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. And um, I hope that at the end of this, we'll all understand the burden of a, a person like uh, Babatunde Rajifashola and the rest of us as parents and the burden for building a nation. It's any nation that is not consciously investing in building its next generation is a nation without a future. Any nation that does not seriously commit in processes now and for the future to ensure that at every stage of his nationhood, there will be the right kind of people that will be able to take hold of that country is not a serious country in any form. I have no apologies for being a Nigerian. The one thing I am always proud to say anywhere is that I am proud of my Nigerianness because there's so many great things about us as a nation. We're kind people, we're hospitable people, we're dynamic people, we're highly driven people, we're personable, we have a lot of gifts, we have a lot of talent, and God on his own side did a lot where Nigeria is concerned because I think there are many nations that would die to have the things that we have. But, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. And it doesn't matter what you've been given, it's about how you use it to achieve what you need to achieve. And some don't have, but they work hard to use what they have to get what they want. I'll just give you a few statistics. Because when we're talking about the youth in Nigeria, mapping the future, it's about making all of us think about how we are going to map, map what our future would look like. And what our future would look like is about the things that we do now. 
about what each and every one of us do. We can look at the part of the government, we can look at the part of the federal, the state governments, every form of government, but there are parts that even we as individuals, as parents, as families, as communities, as constituencies that take charge of different parts of what becomes our nation. Because what is a nation? Nigeria itself is just a landmass. The land can never hurt or do anything to you. What makes the difference is the people that are constituted within it. And those people are formed as families and households. So what you get ultimately as the nation is how each of the household within the nation functions. Because it's the summation, the totality of the, the quality of our households is the quality of the nation that we end up with. And if our value system and everything else begins to fall apart at the level of our household, ultimately, the value system of our society will fall apart. According to the United Nations statistics, there are about 1.2 billion young people between ages of 15 to 24 globally as at 2015, accounting for one out of every six human beings that exist. Now, that's the story as of 2015. It is predicted that by 2030, that there would be about 1.3 billion young people in the world. Now, move back, move further again and say this global trend has particular pertinence for Africa because right now everybody is saying this is the last emerging continent. But we have the opportunity, will we convert it into real value that will change our story as a continent? I don't know if, like me, you watch CNN a lot and your heart is broken every time you look at one more African child, which includes many Nigerian children, that perishes in the Mediterranean or that is shopped around from country to country in Europe asking for them to be received into their country as what? As fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh unwanted citizens of a continent that wants nothing from them. Or that you watch all the rants and the comments that come out of the almighty America, you ask yourself, what exactly is it that we need to make our country work for every one of us that God has not given to us? If for nothing else, but to take the shame and the embarrassment off of ourselves and our generations and to save our young people from this state of destitutness in a, in a sense, we need to make things work. The global trend has particular pertinence to Africa and because Africa has the largest concentration of young people in the world. Now, having young people has two ways. It can be a major asset because it means you have a lot of able-bodied people that can work, that can think, that are ready to take risks, that are dynamic, they're driven, they're, the major, they're your productive uh, manpower. But they can also become a liability. It depends on how you manage them. According to uh, the United Nations, 226 million youths aged 15 to 24 lived in Africa by 2015, representing nearly 20% of Africa's uh, population. Now, by 2030, the share of Africa's youth in the world is forecast, uh, forecasted to increase to 42%. Now, what you need to imagine is if 42% of the population of Africa and then come back home and think about the size of Nigeria compared to the rest of Africa, we're the largest nation in Africa, we're the most populous nation. Of every black man on the face of the earth, one is a Nigerian. We're 25% of the population. And at the end of the day, if you have 42% as young people without a plan mapped out for them, for their future. We have a crisis. Because literally, it's one out of every two persons within the country or the continent that is young and maybe not positively engaged. Now, can we do anything about it? Because we, we lay a lot of blames at the door of young people. Oh, they're lazy, they expect this, they do that, they do. But think about it, we were young ones. And we seem to have done right. Why did we do right? I went to University of Ife. I didn't go to Imperial College or anything. 
Many of us went to Nigerian universities. And right now, I can proudly say, I sit on the advisory board of the topmost executive education school in, the, in, in Europe. I sit on the board of ESA Business School, but I went to the University of Ife. What does that mean? I got a good education in a Nigerian university. And everything else I did after, all my business uh, ventures are from Nigeria. My experience and my learnings were here. And with that, I only went to ESA for my MBA. But in my class for the 18 months, I did leave a legacy of being a Nigerian. And I'm the only person from that class, who, even though I was the only African, I'm the only person who sits on the advisory board of that topmost university. Meanwhile, there are people from all over Europe and America that were in my class. What is the point I want to make with that? It's that we can't do this. It's that we have done it before. It's that we offered, we, our generation, were given a good education in Nigerian universities. And it gave us the foundation. As we were taught in the universities, our families gave us the rest of the lessons in the value system, in the upbringings, in how we were taught the difference between right and wrong, in how we were taught about community, in how we were taught to do things, not just considering ourselves, but considering the impact on the rest of our neighbors. It's all of those things that has helped all of us to find our way. I know that 